Hi, I'm Andrew Watson from Creative Guitar Studio. Thanks for tuning in to another one of my video blogs. It is uh, Saturday, February 19th, 2011, and uh, I've got some pretty good questions I'm going to go through today. The first one's coming at us from Tyler out in Norfolk, Virginia. He wrote in saying, I've got the hang of all the simple G, C, and D chords at the end of the neck, and I, I'm linking them together to create cool progressions. The only thing is I don't know how many uh, chords other than the F shapes uh, can play further up the neck like you usually do in your videos. Can you tell me some chords that can be used on the upper part of the neck? Um, and uh, basically, I think the thing that you're thinking about here are essentially bar chords. So, you know, when it comes down to bar chords, I, they're the basic movable shapes, but there's an, another theory out there called the cage system, which is a really interesting system. And I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. It goes C, A, G, E, and D chords. And what happens with each of those shapes is you can pull them out and make them movable. Now, you do have to refinger them. So there's a C chord, I refingered it, baby finger, ring, and middle. And I just dragged it out into second position as becoming, from C is becoming a D. And then you can move it forward and go E, F, G. And each one of those chords can do that. You know, the A major chord, you can make it into a bar chord. And just refinger it with my third finger. Slide it up the neck like so. Uh, G chord, a little bit more challenging. You gotta kind of flatten your, you know, index finger and do this baby finger and ring finger idea. But um, yeah, it's the same principle like a G chord moving it up to second position to get an A chord and then B, C and so on. And then E chord is the same kind of thing. You just basically bar it and refinger it going middle finger, baby finger, uh, sorry, a ring finger, baby finger and middle finger and then just pull that up the neck the same way. Uh, and then finally D, same kind of scenario. You refinger it and then just pull that up the neck. And I did a video on bar chords and I did a video also on um, the cage system. So probably if you watch those two, you'll get a very good idea of how all these chords move along the neck. All right, the next question coming at us is from Nathan. He wrote in saying, in my attempts to master the locations of the scale degrees on the fretboard, I've been deriving on paper and on my guitar every possible mode of the major scale uh, in every possible key. But what about scales that don't follow the arrangement of the whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half step pattern? Like a, a scale that would have a flat second with maybe a major sixth or even a third or a seventh. Uh, how should I think of those to best memorize them and are they related to each other? Um, well, they're probably one of two things. It's probably, if you're st going away, and, I, and just to clarify with people, if you don't know the whole, whole half thing that um, you know, he was talking about there, Nathan was talking about in the, in the email, it was, it's basically a major scale. When you drag that you know, going along the neck, you get this whole, whole half, uh, you know, or tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone uh, scale formula. Now, once you break away from that, you're probably doing another type of scale, like maybe uh, a scale like um, harmonic minor or melodic minor. Or, you know, there's a, I, I don't know if it's still published, but I have an old book uh, in the shelves of my office that's, uh, it's called Scales of the World. And it talks about all kinds of different, you know, scale patterns. And you probably heard Joe Satriani talk about a scale called Enigmatic. You know, there's, there's all kinds of different patterns out there. So it may be a more world-based scale, or it may be something that's uh, uh, more commonly, you'll find them just as a derivative of either a harmonic minor or a melodic minor. So that's pretty much you know, what the, sc the scoop is. But essentially, just remember a couple things. You know, if it's got a minor third, so if the movement goes minor third, or so you know, like a, a whole step plus a half step, that's a minor bass sounding scale. Um, if you have a major third in the scale, it's basically a major type of scale. So that can help you with the harmony aspects and help you understand how to use it. Um, and then don't forget, as soon as you kind of come up with some kind of new scale idea, make sure you build the chords out of that scale and create, you know, a harmonized concept, you know, with the scale. Learn the shapes along the neck and study that. That'll help with your application of some kind of backing track to be able to actually use that scale. Now the next question comes to us from Jim out in Michigan. He's saying here, I was wondering if you could talk about how to properly turn on and off a tube amp and also discuss speaker impedance settings. And this is great because there are some specific instructions you want to learn for turning your tube amp on and off. So um, let's uh, go and check out the tube amp and uh, cover this question. So first let's talk about tu uh, turning the tube amp on. Uh, what you'll want to have is that standby switch into the standby mode or off position basically. And uh, then the next thing is you want to fire up your main. 
and let that amp warm up for about uh, 50 or 60 seconds, at least about a minute or so. Most of the uh, instruction manuals for your tube amps will, will say to leave the uh, amp on for one minute before actually firing up uh, the amp, uh, or in other words, turning the standby switch on so that you're running uh, full power. Uh, through the tubes. Now, if you don't let the tubes warm up before slamming them with, you know, 100 volts of, uh, of electricity, um, you're probably going to damage those tube plates. So just be really careful about that. Always read your amplifier's instruction manual after the amp has been on for, you know, about 50 or 60 seconds in standby mode, then it's safe to put the amp into regular operation by flipping the standby switch on. Okay, now let's talk about uh, turning the tube amp down. Basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna switch the amplifier into standby mode, and when things uh, stop amplifying at your instrument, it's basically safe to turn the main power off. Now that's usually after about three seconds or so, but some amps can take a little bit longer. It's just, you know, as soon as the amp stops amplifying the instrument, once you've switched over in standby mode, then uh, you're good to go to shut the main power down and uh, power down the whole amp. Now, uh, if you turn that filament supply off while there's still high voltage on the tubes, you know, you do run the risk of the, something called cathode stripping. So uh, be very careful about that. Um, you know, some final words I may want to say here are just basically be gentle with your tubes. It's really a good thing to do that. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of old tube amps running on uh, very old uh, tubes, usually not factory tubes though, uh, and they can still be going strong after 20 or 30 years on those old tubes. So uh, make sure you do that. And also, I, I think that it's important to note that it's not a good idea to leave the uh, amp running hot with both the main power and the standby switch on because uh, that can cause damage to those tubes as well. Uh, I know a lot of people really have this belief about burning in tubes. Uh, I, I personally just think that's kind of an urban myth uh, and unnecessary um, and even possibly able to damage tubes. So I personally don't advise it, but um, you know, to each his own. If you want to try and do that, <laughs> be my guest, but uh, I for one would not do that. And the last thing I want to say about uh, this is definitely read your owner's manual. Tube amps are really not like a basic analog amp. They're a little bit more involved. So read that owner's manual and get that down. Let's move next though to the whole idea of uh, impedance. All right, next let's talk about impedance switch settings. Uh, basically, most of your 212 amplifiers are wired the, with those 212 inch speakers in parallel. And a lot of those speakers are basically gonna be 16 ohm speakers wired in parallel. So the impedance load is uh, going to be eight ohms. You can see just like this uh, factory setting here that we have on this PV. Uh, Valve King 212. Um, let's talk though about some other settings. Uh, 4 ohms, you know, if you were to go and maybe add another 8 ohm cabinet, uh, I'd switch that setting down to 4 ohms. Uh, so if you're running two 8 ohm cabinets, the amp should also be set at uh, 4 ohms. Maybe if you disconnected the two speakers that are in this particular amp here and you were running uh, two 8 ohm cabinets uh, out of the amp and almost using the amp as a, as a head. Uh, that's what you'd want that ohm switch set at four. But uh, eight ohms, let's talk quickly about that. Also other eight ohm settings, you know, situations. Uh, let's say when you're running the factory enclosed speakers, of course, you're gonna want that, uh, they're, they're running two 16 ohm speaker, uh, speakers here. So you want that set at, uh, at eight ohms. Um, but let's say if you were running something like maybe two 16 ohm cabinets, uh, that the amp here should also be set at uh, eight ohms. Um, so keep that in mind. But let's also quickly quickly talk about the 16 ohm setting. Um, the 16 ohm switch position, uh, really you won't only want to use that if you possibly replace the stock speakers with different speakers that were uh, of a different uh, wiring because mostly, remember most of these are wired in parallel. So perhaps if the wiring was done in series, uh, you'd want to have that switch switched over to 16 ohms. But the important note I want to make here is you always want to check the wiring of any speakers uh, with a meter. You know, don't trust what that speaker says. Get a, a meter, check it before plugging in any speakers to your external speaker jacks or, uh, you know, just trying to match something. And if you have inc incorrect wiring or, or in incorrect impedance load settings, you know, it could damage the amp. So, uh, and remember those kind of damages, a lot of times they're not covered under your warranty. So if you have a new amp and you start monkeying around with different kind of cabinets and you don't even know what the ohm setting 
is or the speakers and how they're wired inside that cabinet, you're running the risk of damaging your amp. So be very careful with your impedance switch settings. And I feel pretty safe in saying that most of your 212 amplifiers, uh, you know, like this Valve King 212 here that I'm demonstrating this on, most of these amps will be wired from the factory in parallel and the impedance load setting should be set at eight ohms. If you're a little bit unsure, visit the discussion forums of your uh, amps uh, product manufacturer or phone the uh, product manufacturer's uh, help uh, customer support line and find out before you start doing any kind of uh, rewiring or hookups of other types of speaker cabinets uh, situations. Well, that's about all the time I have for today. I'm kind of in a rush, so sorry for the short video here. But anyway, thanks for watching and for sending in all the great questions. I have to head out and do a gig right away. So uh, also I want to mention, keep in mind, I'm doing a podcast. They come out every Monday. Uh, and until next time, take care, have a great week, and we will catch up with you on my next video blog. Bye for now.